going to be looking at some things that I think are really important today. We're going to go over to Romans chapter 16. Being old uh, and being in the ministry for over 50 years, I've been lived through enormous changes, at least attempted changes within fundamental Christianity, and have been in the midst of the battle of trying to fight to keep the truth uh, at the forefront of all of these issues. Someone once asked me, how long have you been doing this, have been in the ministry? I said, well, it's hard to really explain. He said, but I have counted to infinity twice. <laughs> uh, been a long time. And uh, uh, the tragedy of all of this is that in the process of, of being in the battle for truth. Uh, taking a stand for the truth often times has been done alone. And over the years it cost me some dear friends. Not because I quit being their friend, but because they quit being mine. And uh, I would continue to be their friends and still am today. I pray for them regularly. But uh, I love them, I think. And some of the names that I'm going to mention today are men I hold in very high regard and respect a great deal, although I could not fellowship with them. I could not have a working partnership with them anymore because I believe there's been some departure. And that is the substance of Romans chapter uh, 16. And uh, of course, the text we'll look at today is verses 17 through 20. And I'm going to be doing exactly what God commands me to do in this text. I'm not going to be able to name them all, nor is it my intent. But uh, last week we addressed the issue of gospel centrism, which sounds wonderful, right? We said, well, that's wonderful. Every church should be gospel centered, but that's not what gospel centrism is. Gospel centrism is to advance the position of Reformed theology and Calvin's doctrine of salvation to preeminence, otherwise monergism, and that salvation is when God chooses someone to be saved, regenerates them uh, at some undetermined time in their life, giving them the gifts of faith and repentance, whereby they will be unable to resist the grace of God, will eventually believe, but they are born again before all of that happens, that's regeneration. And uh, that is, of course, a very serious false doctrine. Gospel centrism is connected to monergism. Again, if you don't have a great understanding of what that is, I do house calls. I'd be glad to come and explain that to you. There is a book on the back called The Poison Tulip. Uh, we welcome you to pick up one of those. They're free, and you can read that. It explains that in the first few chapters. As I've said, I've had many friends over the years that I still count as very faithful men of God. And uh, we're going to mention a few of them today. They wouldn't agree with me on this issue because they are Calvinists. One of those was a man by the name of uh, Roland McEwen, tremendous Bible scholar, tremendous man of God. Strong separatist all of his life, but he was a Calvinist and a monergist taught at both Central Baptist Theological Seminary in Minneapolis and uh, was a pastor at Fourth Baptist for a few, uh, at least a year, I think. And then he went over to Detroit Theological Seminary, which is also a Calvinist institution. But Roland McEw uh, McEwen made this uh, review of reclaiming authentic fundamentalism, which was written by Dr. Doug McLaughlin, who was also reformed in his soteriology. And he wrote a book called Reclaiming Authentic Fundamentalism. Now, we quoted from the original book, which was uh, the, the book that he, I think, got his title from, which was Reclaiming Authentic Evangelicalism, which was written by a group of new evangelicals, new evangelicals. But here's what uh, Dr. McEwen said. Militancy has always characterized fundamentalism. By the way, fundamentalism is Bible-believing Christianity. That's all it is. It is not so much a matter of personality as adherence to principle. 
militancy has been so fogged over by its detractors that it's become a wholly negative concept, even for many fundamentalists. And of course, we have been bombarded over the years. If you hold to Bible fundamentalism and you're not more inclusivistic, then you are legalistic, you are unloving, you are uncaring, and you are divisive. And that's, those are the labels. I've even been called a hyper-fundamentalist. Otherwise, I've gone beyond what the Bible says. There is another quote here by Dr. George Houghton, who has, of course, uh, he was a professor of Old Testament at uh, Faith Baptist Theological Seminary, tremendous man of God, solid in most of his uh, theology, but he too is reformed. He too is a monergist. And uh, he gave an excellent definition of militancy. He said, what exactly is militancy anyway? And he was a strong separatist. One dictionary says it is to be engaged in warfare or combat, aggressively active as in a cause. It springs from one's values, is expressed as an attitude, and results in certain behavior. One's values are those things in which one strongly believes. They are what one believes to be fundamentally important and true. And from this comes an attitude which is unwilling to tolerate any divergence. That's an important word. We'll see later on what's now developing in what's called divergent evangelicalism. We'll see that this afternoon. From this comes an attitude which is unwilling to tolerate any divergence from these fundamentally important truths that seeks to defend them. It results in behavior which speaks up when these truths are attacked or diluted and which refuses to cooperate with any activity which would minimize their importance. The term is a military one and carries the idea of defending what one believes to be true. Those are the terms from which we get the scriptures. Uh, contend earnestly for the faith, Jude 3. Come out from among them and be ye separate. That's not the unclean, as Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 6. Over and over and over again, the terms of humility in Ephesians chapter 6. Why? We put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against wickedness in high places. Militancy. The Bible especially the epistles, is steeped in terms of militancy. Now, we come here to Romans chapter 16. And now at the summation of Paul's epistle to the Romans, now we're not there yet, we're jumping ahead, because we are dealing with the gift of the, prof, of the pastor, teacher, or the pastor, or the teacher. All of these are encompassed here, which makes it your responsibility as well, because we are all commissioned to go into all the world and preach or to make disciples, either one which is involved in teaching. So if that is true, then we are seeing that in verse 17, the beseech here is to what? Brethren, that's all of us. And we have a responsibility. Now, all of the doctrines that Paul has taught up to this point now are put into our laps. This is your responsibility now, what Paul is saying here. You become the depository of truth. Every local church is, every Christian is. And if no one else stands for that truth, you must stand for it by yourself. That's a concept of what we have. It's a great responsibility. For if we let one part of it go, it's not long before we've left, left, let more parts of it go, and pretty soon it'll be all gone. And that's the dissolution of abdication or the... Uh, what we call the abdication of dogmatism, where now you can just believe whatever you want and it doesn't make any difference. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll read this text. Father, as we open up your word today and read this admonition that you've given us through your apostle, we pray that each one of us would understand it from the context of the priesthood of all believers and the responsibilities that come with that ministry. We pray today that you would give us understanding. And we pray that we would own it and take it for ourselves. For Lord, we do not 
just fight against the air of the world. We seek to win them to Christ. We seek to persuade them. And so, Lord, this prayer does not come forth from bitterness. It comes from passion. And, Lord, so many people we love and know dearly who have been led astray and have taken a pathway of, of compromise. We pray that, Lord, we could be effective in reaching them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Paul now begins this text. And we'll be looking at this in some depth as we go through it. But he says in verse 16, or verse 17, he says, now, what is that now? At the conclusion of everything I've taught you in the book of Romans up to this point. This is a summary statement. He says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions, heresies, heresies, and offenses, what? Contrary to, now look, look, what's that word? The doctrine. What is that? We'll look at that in a minute, but it's essentially equivalent to the faith. So mark those which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. It's a definite article. It's very important. Which you have learned in what I've taught you now in the book of Romans. And then what? Avoid them. For they that cause divisions and offenses, they are that they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. That means they're in it for themselves. They're not in it for you. They're willing to compromise the truth because they're not in it for you. They're in following, they're, they're building their own following. And they're gathering and building their own empire. But the, the true disciple maker is not building his own empire. He's building the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by, look at this, good words and fair speeches. Deceive the hearts of the simple. Now we've already talked about being a lazy learner. Who is the simple here? That's a lazy learner. That's a person who is not willing to get involved in the, the depth of, of biblical exegesis and solid hermeneutics and involving and exacting out the meaning of what the word of God says. But you see, the deceiver preys upon the hearts of the simple. There's no one more dangerous than the person who's never been discipled. Now, verse 19, he says, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Wow, what a testimony. I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Don't lose the fact that there is a mystery of inequity in the world that doth already work. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Otherwise, judgment's coming. And he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, the grace, uh, the word grace is the embodiment of the indwelling spirit of Christ and the enabling of that. And that's a concept of being with you. And then amen, or so be it. Now, look at verse 19. In verse 19, God commends the Roman believers here through the Apostle Paul for their obedience to the faith. And then warns them in the next sentence. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would. Have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's great that you know the Bible. It's great that you've learned the truth. But don't be ignorant about the devices of, of the wicked one. That is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6. The rulers and powers of, wit, of darkness in this world. Because they're subtle. And they come disguised as angels of light. Now the word evil is from... 
the Greek word kekos. And the context would imply the meaning to be uh, about worthless teaching that is harmful or injurious. Uh, he says, I, I don't want you to be ignorant of that. The context is established because the word simple is from the, the Greek word akaraxis, meaning unmixed in the sense of being unmixed with false teaching. So therefore the word simple here means harmless. The intended meaning of the last part of Romans 6, 19, 16 19 must be able to have you wise unto that which is good and harmless concerning harmful false doctrine. I don't want you to become partners with them in the harm that they're doing. In 54 years of ministry, I've seen the harm that false doctrine does. It is absolutely devastating. I've seen it destroy families. I've seen it destroy marriages. I've seen it destroy relationships between parents and their children. I've seen it destroy churches. And I've served as an advisory capacity going, capacity going into churches and, and advising them how to be restored after they've experienced a church split over some stupid, foolish nonsense. I would have you wise unto that which is good and harmless concerning harmful false doctrine. So the harmful false doctrine refers to what Paul said earlier when speaking of good words and fair speeches that are intended to be, what? Deceive the hearts of the simple, of the ignorant, of the lazy learner. You don't think that Satan knows who you are and knows what you believe? And he is going to send along people to you who will lead you down a pathway because you are ignorant of something. Now I'll say, right now I'll raise my hand and I'll say, I, I, I've been down that pathway. I've been down that pathway and by the grace of God he's recovered me from it. But the Bible doctrine of separation Otherwise, we can't cooperate with people or local churches who have uh, moved away from the center of God's will. It is not something with which to trifle. The Bible doctrine of separation could, should certainly never be reduced the way gospel centrists are attempting to reduce it. Otherwise, as long as they're Calvinists, we can have fellowship with them. It doesn't make anything else what they believe. No, no. So to propose that Christians focus on the center while ignoring the parameters is ludicrous and bizarre. Now such a proposition is to say the center of biblical truth is more important than the boundaries established by the biblical truth. Does that sound pretty crazy? But that's what's going on. Yeah, stay in the center, that's good. But remember there is a point where you cross over into the darkness. But before you get to that point of crossing over in the darkness, you've already crossed over into the shadows of darkness. And understand and know the divisions. To emphasize the unity of the spirit, Ephesians 4.3, without the unity of faith, of the faith, Ephesians 4.13 is being done at the sacrifice of doctrinal continuity. Otherwise, the, doc the doctrinal continuity of the word of God is that the Bible is a harmony. A choir that never sings out of key. Always fulfilling each of its parts. But they would say, well, there's a lot of contradictions in the Bible. And therefore, unless we understand the contradictions, we can never understand it all. No, there are parts of the Bible we don't understand, but that doesn't mean that they're contradictory. The very idea of such a paradox, I think, is a ludicrous and bizarre proposition. And this is what the new evangelicals have done, new or, or neo-evangelicals. There was a new kind of evangelicalism. Now remember, most of Reformed theology 
was where the word evangelical came. Luther was the first to be considered an evangelical. He believed that, uh, you know, that there was some involvement in, in evangelizing the world. But this is what the new evangelicals have done for years and is the practice of those within the varying degrees now of what we know as emergent Christianity or divergent Christianity or divergent evangelicalism. We'll look at that more this afternoon. Now certainly we understand we're not talking about doctrinal unanimity. Right? We're not unanimous, theological. If we were to get together and we would have a conversation, even with a group of other pastors, there's going to be variations of beliefs that, that are, are going to be held. And, and we have to give people individual soul liberty within those issues. Now, there has to be a line where we draw. Otherwise, the boundaries, the parameters. Otherwise, if you go past this, you can't be a member of Shepherd's Full Baptist Church. But there is a wide diversity of beliefs that you can hold within our doctrinal statement and still be considered orthodox, even though there's some variations on it. So, however, there certainly should be doctrinal unanimity on, on what defines the church and how it is to be governed. We have dogmatism in the word of God about that. There certainly should be doctrinal unanimity on what the gospel is and how people get saved. We certainly have extensive amount of scripture on that, what it is and what it isn't. There certainly should be doctrinal unanimity on what the Bible teaches about the end times and the Christian's part in these future events. We have overwhelming amount of doctrinal dogmatism regarding those things. And there certainly should be doctrinal unanimity on whether signed gifts have ceased or if they've continued throughout the church age. We have an enormous wealth of information from the Word of God on that. So these are very important issues of orthodoxy that radically impact orthopraxy or right practice, which impacts what? Orthopathy, which is the, our right emotions, our right attitudes about all of these things. Now, don't ever allow your orthodoxy to transition in its practice, orthopraxy, out of orthopathy, which is that we are to speak the truth in love. Otherwise, it has to be done in the right attitude. I hate false doctrine, but I am seeking to win those with false doctrine back to right doctrine, and so I'm going to be gentle and kind and tender. Even though there may come a time when I say, I can't, I can't work with you. I can't partner with you. But I'm going to minister to you. I love you enough to keep fighting for you. So to define the unity of the spirit outside of its parameters of, of, of the statement in Ephesians 4, 5 through 6 is equally ludicrous and bizarre. What is that statement? One Lord. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through you all and in you all. That is connecting yourself to the sovereignty of God and the word of God. This simple statement is not intended to reduce unity down to one commonality as does the foolish, foolish notion of gospel centrism. If we agree on Calvinism, we should be able to get along. <laughs> The simple statement of Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 is, is in fact expands the unity of the spirit exponentially by the phrase, the faith. That definite article there is absolutely critical. Not many faiths, not being inclusivistic, not being tolerant, but there's only one faith. Beginning with the Lord Jesus Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Begins there. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men. Whereby we must be saved. You see, therefore there is only one correct interpretation defining the one faith. You and I may hold to different interpretations. But 
That only simply means that we both can be wrong, but we both can't be right. There is the one interpretation that we seek out. Otherwise, what has God said? And then we become a thus saith the Lord kind of person. True unity of the spirit will only be found where there is unanimity within the parameters of the one faith. That is where we seek to be. And I will openly have that discussion with anyone. And I have for 50 years ministry. I've had it with Roman Catholics and Mormons. And, and uh, I've had it with New Evangelicals. I've had it with Jehovah Witnesses. I've had it with Seventh-day Adventists. And any one of a hundred others that you could mention. I've tried to lovingly and meticulously share them in many cases to bring them to Christ. Well, then who gets to decide what defines unanimity? Who gets to decide? Does a Bible college get to define this? Does a Bible seminary get to define this? I mean, these are the most educated, right? The fact is, most of these institutions have been captured. And they are no longer Bible. They are systemic in their positions. Otherwise, a system of theology, not systematic, that's different. You see, every individual in every local church must define unanimity for themselves. We have to define what the faith is. You have to do it for yourself, and the local church has to do it. And that's why we have a doctrinal statement. Now, what has happened to doctrinal statements today? Go to a church and visit there sometime and say, do you have a doctrinal statement I could read? <laughs> look it up on their website. Look at how many churches you look up on their website and say, oh, you know, doctrinal statement. Our, our whole doctrinal statement is in our, on our website. We're not hiding behind anything. We come right out in the, right out in the open and stay where we are. But today they don't want to. Now it's gotten so far today that they... They even take uh, the name of their belief system out, so you can't even trace it to there. So they take the name Baptist out of their, their names anymore. Now, quite frankly, I, I said, thank you. You're not going to be that. I'm glad you take it out of your name. But, uh, you know, now it is, you, you know, uh, whatever. You, you can make it up to make yourself as ambiguous as possible and to bring in as wide a broad a cloud of people as you can. <clears throat> that's a Joel Osteen philosophy don't talk about doctrine unhitch yourself from the Bible we'll talk about that this afternoon so the unity of the spirit will only be found where there is unanim unanimity within the parameters of the one faith now Every one of us has to do what we need to do to ensure no believer will be led astray by identifying with someone or another local church that teaches false doctrine and practices separation that appears to endorse false doctrine. So you choosing a local church that falls within your biblical, the, the, not your biblical, but the Bible's definition of the faith is very critical. Now Romans 16, 17 through 20 appears almost as a parenthesis within the context of Paul's salutation to the faithful believers within various local churches at Rome. But the text is Paul's final statement defining a true opus dei, or a universal call to holiness and righteousness, right doctrine. That's what he is. He's, he is saying, okay, everything that is outside of the parameters of what I've taught you now in these first 15 chapters Separate yourself. Mark them. Because they're going to cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Mark them. So he pleads with these faithful believers to mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Uh, which you have learned. And what? Avoid them. Now there are two admonitions in the text. Highlight them in your Bible. These faithful believers were to mark the people that caused divisions and offenses contrary to doctrine, and they were to avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. 
Now the word mark, from the Greek word skopio, which literally means to take aim at. Now some of you are sighting your rifles in or your guns in for deer season right now. And when you aim at something, you're not aiming at the big target, you're aiming at the what? The center. We call it the bullseye. That's what this word means. Mark the bullseye. Put a point on that. You see, uh, put a point on that target. That's what the concept here, mark them, put a point on them. Point them out. The word avoid from a Greek word which means to deviate. So the idea is walk away from such a person. There is a time when you have to walk away. And there are other people that you can invest your time in. And, and uh, there are, I always say, there, there are, it gets, comes a time in some people's life when you have to leave them up to prayer. Or leave them up to the circumstances of life where God can bring someone else along. My wife and I just got news recently of a young man that we knew many, many years ago was a strong Calvinist, five-pointed, and now he's abandoned it completely. And uh, he, he, just a fine young man. Now, he always was a strong young man, but now he's got his doctrine right. <laughs> I could work with him now. So obviously, the, to, to avoid that person, to walk away from that per person, is the intent of biblical separation. Walk away. You, you can't keep having fellowship with that person. Fellowship is a working partnership. So this so-called new pathway of gospel centrism is a pathway on which faithful believers cannot walk, especially with those corrupting militant separation into soft separatism and still be faithful. In the last, oh, 20 years or so, one of the seminaries that, if I were to say the name, you would all know it very well, was losing students and they decided that they wanted to merge with another seminary and they went to that seminary even though they held very similar theologies said we would like to merge with you and that other seminary said no we can't do that with you because you are practicing soft separatism and that's not where we're at. So it's a serious enough for spiritual men to separate from their associations, whether that is individual associations or local church associations. And when prominent personalities dominate the premise of orthodoxy rather than rightly dividing the word of truth, those doing so are shunning the mark them that should be put on these men for their apparent compromises. If you love people, you can't do that. You can't compromise and love people. So the failure to mark them because certain prominent people are held in high regard, those failing have accepted a pathway of false practice foreign to every Bible-believing fundamentalist for thousands of years. How do we know that they were faithful? Because thousands over the centuries have adorned the true doctrine of militant biblical separation with their own blood. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Not the short version of 360 pages. Read the whole version of 3,000 pages. And it will tell you that true biblical Christianity has been being murdered for standing militantly for the faith for hundreds of years. Now when we talk about these great truths, I'm telling you today as a personal testimony, I've lived through this. I've seen it happen. That's why if you see the handbook for discipleship, you'll see a man there on the back covers who wrote a, uh, a recommendation for the handbook for discipleship. His name was Dr. Ernie Pickering. Tremendous man of God. And we came to be very close friends toward the end of his life. Uh, and that actually came out of a question 
when uh, we got together one time at a conference, a Bible conference, he was one of the speakers there. And he said to me, are you any relation to Dr. Robert Ketchum? And I said, yeah, Robert Ketchum is my dad, but not the same one you're talking about. The Dr. Robert Ketchum that he was talking about spelled the name with A-M, and he was the founder of the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches. And he had been at one time the president of the Independent Fundamental Churches of America, and had left the IFCA movement, which was also called the Bible Church movement, because of their drift into New Evangelicalism, mainly because they were getting their pastors out of Dallas Theological Seminary and the Conservative Baptist Seminary in Colorado. And so he left the IFCA and eventually became part of the Conservative Baptist Seminary, left there because of their drift into, into uh, even New Evangelicalism, and left there and went out to Pennsylvania and became president of the seminary of the GARC, General Association of Regular Baptist Churches. And guess what he did there? He had to separate from them. And out of that come two classic books, actually three altogether, on biblical separatism. Now, why are those important books? They're classics. Let me tell you why. Because he wrote them in the midst of the fire. Otherwise, he not just wrote about it, he lived it. And every time he left and separated, he paid dearly for it. Otherwise, it cost him very prominent positions within the groups of people that he led both within the um, Bible movement. He was the uh, national director and the editor of the Voice Merit magazine. In the conservative Baptist church, which a lot of the churches who left the North American Baptist Convention, left those because they went into liberalism. And they then formed what we know here in Minnesota as the uh, Minnesota Baptist Association of Churches. But before that, it was always a conservative Baptist convention. But it went New Evangelical too. But that didn't mean it ended. The battle continues. And it's in the midst of that because I have very similar backgrounds with Dr. Pickering and the associations that I've been involved with that we become very close friends. Another a friend of mine was a man by the name of Dr. John Whitcomb. How many of you have ever read the book, The Genesis Flood? Written by Dr. John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. He's written a lot of classical books. He was um, the professor of Old Testament at Grace Theological Seminary in, in uh, I think it was in Nebraska. A man of incredible Bible knowledge. When I would have him to preach, I would sit at his, sit at the dinner table with him and just listen to him talk while I sat and took notes. I'd ask questions. Incredible man. And when he would not adapt the inclusivist policy of Grace Theological Seminary and begin to incorporate the more critical view of uh, textual criticism uh, into his theology and adapt more the critical view of, of uh, historicity of Israel. He wouldn't adapt that. They attacked him and essentially dismissed him or resigned him, if you will. But he stayed true. He stayed true. He was part of the Berean movement. Pretty much the way we believe, except they practice triune baptism. They set you down and dunk you three times forward. Other than that, pretty much the same as we believe. Strong dispensations. I 
I can't tell you how many men I've known in my lifetime who have paid dearly to fight the fight of faith, to contend for the faith. They've fought for very, very people and for the truth so that there'd be another generation of people who would be able to teach others also. That's why Shepherd Full Baptist Church exists. So there'd be another generation. These young people that we see here today. The battles that we have fought over the last 2,000 years, they're going to fight similar battles. Or oh, there'll be different names on them. Because they'll come addressed by different people that they're going to have to mark and they're going to have to avoid. Those two little guys that walk the aisle and receive our offering every Sunday. These young men that play the piano. Other families here. Oh yeah, our, my old white hoary head is going to, going to be gone one of these days. But we fight the fight so there's another generation. We teach who will teach others also. That's what it's all about. That's not going to happen if you're one of those simpletons who are just as ignorant of the Bible and you're lazy about your study of the Bible. It's an incredible amount of work. Beginning with the gospel. It's not, not a matter of that. It's, it's just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Every Christian and Christian don't believe that. It's what you need to do with that gospel. You need to understand and believe that God's wrath has been once for all forever satisfied. That Jesus took your sin, every sin, every sin you have committed, every sin you will commit in his body, and he propitiated the wrath of God for that sin, and God's satisfied with it. And he wants to justify you. He wants to gift you his righteousness. If you are willing to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God incarnate in human flesh, your kinsman redeemer, and call upon his name in absolute desperation to save your wretched soul from eternal hell. And if you call, he promises that he will, if you receive him, he will come and dwell within you and you will be born again into a new Genesis. It all begins there. But after that, as you are born again, you are made part of a new body, a priest, Melchizedek, and you are responsible for the word of God. And that you're going to have to fight for every single jot and tittle with every new generation that rises up on him, on on, the, on on planet Earth. And it is your responsibility to be prepared. First of all, it's to sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And because you've done that, be ready to give an answer to every man who asketh you of the reason of the hope that's in you. You have to be ready. Father God, as we bow and close this time, we pray for any here today who are not born again, who have made some, perhaps some superficial decision. I pray for them. I pray for that they open, the, open their eyes and see their need to be born again and what, what they must do to do, be so. And then I pray for Christians here today. That Lord, you'd help each of us to receive this admonition to mark them and avoid them. Pray that you'd help us to make decisions today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brother Clay.